Hey, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this week's episode, we have an incredibly special treat. Over the years, I've had different voices, different individuals on The Underground who work with a ministry called GCM. GCM is Global Catalytic Ministries. We've had some of them in studio with us. We've interviewed some overseas. And um, GCM is a ministry that I personally am wholeheartedly behind, that I support, and I encourage all of my, uh, my supporters and those who watch The Underground to get behind GCM. GCM works in some of the most closed, restricted, difficult, high-persecution nations in the world, largely in the underground church, again, primarily throughout the Middle East, primarily throughout the Muslim world. And they are seeing tremendous growth. They're seeing amazing miracles. They're seeing amazing salvations on a regular basis. The growth is really stunning. But now, uh, in this interview, we interview a sister named Fazaneh. Farzaneh is from Afghanistan. She is working in Afghanistan, again, with GCM, and just has some great stories, some great testimonies. She's seeing salvation. She's seeing miracles. She's seeing the Lord move. A lot of people don't realize this, by the way, that right now Afghanistan, get this, home of the Taliban, Afghanistan is the second fastest growing church in the world right now, second only to Iran. So um, the Lord is, is moving. It doesn't mean it's the largest church in the world by any means. Uh, the church there is still very new. I mean, it's, it's just barely uh, sort of the cracks in the foundation of the stronghold of the enemy are just being seen. Um, but the growth there, the reproduction is tremendous. It's, it's up there, again, pushing close to 20% growth per year. This is according to various missiological organizations, studies and different things, Operation World, Uh, the Joshua Project, groups like this. So first of all, let me just go ahead and introduce my sister Farzaneh. Farzaneh, first of all, let me just say thank you so much for taking some time to be with us today. It is a blessing to be with you, Joel. Thank you for having me on the underground. Amen. Amen. So first of all, let me just say this. Um, In recent years, the church has heard, the Western church has heard about the tremendous growth uh, of the church in Iran. But what very few people are aware of, which I, I previously mentioned, is that right now Afghanistan is not too far behind the growth in Iran. Afghanistan is actually seeing right now, again, pushing close to 20% multiplication growth every year. So um, this, is, this is just a great testimony that, again, very few people are aware of. What is your experience there in Afghanistan? What are you seeing in terms of people coming to faith? There is a deeper thirst growing in the heart of people. So many are hopeless and constantly in pain and fear in their hearts. This makes them search for light, search for hope, and search for a true loving God that Islam cannot fulfill. Yes, there is many people coming to faith. A decade ago, when I came here, I could never think that one day I would be able to see so many people with their hearts open and coming to Jesus. Afghanistan is a closed country but it is not close to the Holy Spirit who has been touching so many people. Yes. Amen. I love to hear it. So I'm told that uh, many people in Afghanistan are afraid of the Taliban. They're afraid of these different Islamist uh, groups. And I know that you personally have lost friends um, to terrorist attacks. What is the greatest danger for Christians that are living and working in Afghanistan? How many believers do you know who have actually died because of their faith? Fear is always at the door trying to get inside, but the fear of Taliban is not really controlling us, it is just there, 
I think the greatest danger for Christians here is to get distracted with so much pain and hopelessness, fear and etc etc. All that is real, and it is hard when some of these things hit us and get inside of our heart. We can go through anything when our hearts keep looking at Jesus, but when pain, hopelessness and fear take over our hearts, then we don't want to keep fighting the good fight. So I think that is the big danger for Christians living here. Since I have lived here, about 18 foreigners, that I knew, but there was others that was missionaries in other cities that I didn't know, from that nine was close friends. Then there was local believers killed, some recently and still painful to talk about, some in explosions, some disappear, we suppose they are killed but we don't know because don't have the bodies, local people killed I am not sure how many, 12, 15, maybe, I try to not count, some years ago there was one local Christian that couldn't hold well the suffering and tried to kill himself because of persecution, this is what I mean when I said about the biggest danger is to get distracted with pain, hopeless, fear, he was in the public hospital for two weeks, he had a cross to in his arm and because of that the doctors and nurse were very hard on him and they didn't separated his finger, we don't need to be a medical person to know that if the person is burned they need to separate the finger for the skin not get glued together, he asked forgive to God to try to kill himself and on the second week he was at the hospital he had to do a surgery and he died, not sure if died or was killed, on the surgery table, I still remember the smell of his burnt flesh, Besides killing we also have prison, two foreigners and two locals in 2010, I am speaking about people that I was involved with, there was much more people in prison but they weren't my friends, there was kidnapping too but closer to me was just three, two foreigners and one local, all that in the last 11 years, prison for Christian happened less than killing because Afghanistan still depending economic from other countries and it is not good for the Afghan government to be putting Christian in prison, also, because they are busy in trying to stop terrorism, but between death, kidnap and prison, death still best, death is just a moment and next moment they are free forever. Yeah, amen, amen. You know, many people here in the West, we, we sometimes will talk about martyrdom, um, sometimes even in sort of a macho way, you know, we talk about having a value for martyrdom, but the truth is very, very few people here in the West have ever actually lost a loved one or someone that they know uh, for the sake of the gospel, and yet we, we know that the scriptures are clear, um, that unless we are willing to take up our crosses, which essentially means embrace martyrdom, Jesus said we can't actually even be his disciples. Um, there's various passages like this. Unless you're willing to hate your own life, you cannot be my disciple. You can't be a Christian. This is an incredibly difficult call that, again, we in the West are just, it, it's a very foreign concept to us. We get excited about miracles, but we really don't get excited about martyrdom. And yet, increasingly, as we approach his return, this is going to become the norm, and it has been the norm throughout the world, throughout, throughout the history of the Christian Church, and it's increasingly becoming the norm throughout the world, um, but eventually it will actually even reach the Western world, where it will become the norm for Christians to understand that becoming a Christian, identifying as a follower of Jesus, means that we are willing to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel, and for the sake of the one that we love. So Farzaneh, what is your primary method of sharing the gospel? Um, I know everyone has different methods. Uh, GCM uh, has really emphasized DMM, the discipleship-making model. But what is your primary personal approach in terms of um, sharing the gospel with those, again, in this incredibly restricted nation of Afghanistan? The first method is to try to listen from God what is his method for every person. The way that God have been using me is through prayer which makes the person feel the power of God. Other thing is through specific word of knowledge to the person. Some of the times, through prayer, people got healed, or felt peace, joy, love, that is a word that themselves used. And they felt freedom too, all through prayer, before know about Jesus. The freedom, in fact, is just because through prayer we tight the evil for not disturb the person to listen and to have opportunity to decide for Jesus or not. But they say they feel free, like if darkness left. Then it opened doors for start DMM because all this is nothing that ourselves can do with our own strength. 
They see and feel the power of God. Word of knowledge is also impacting for them because they learn that God had spoke with some prophets but they don't know that we can have relationship with God and He speak with us. Then when God reveals something in our hearts it is impacting to them. Some weeks ago God told me and told me again and told me again till I obey to tell a boy who I see almost every day, but never had talked to him before, that he had struggles in his feeling. God told me that he struggled with homosexual feelings but I used the word struggling in his feeling, because I didn't had courage to say struggling with homosexual feelings and I said that God told me that, for him, and for others, it is impacting that God speaks with people like us. That is also an open door to start to share the stories, DMM, that changed lives. Yeah, amen, amen. The thing that I love personally about DMM is that it very much is an obedience based approach to evangelism. It's not really it's not really just evangelism in the in the western sense. We're not just trying to make converts. We're not just trying to get people to pray a prayer or even get baptized. It really is an approach to invitation to sharing the good news and inviting those that hear the good news to come to the table, to come to the coming feast that will be celebrated with Jesus in Jerusalem. But it, it very much is a discipleship-based model, a discipleship-based approach. It really challenges us as the, um, the evangelist, so to speak, the inviter, to look at our own lives, because as we're teaching those that we're reaching out to, um, to be obedient, to listen to the Holy Spirit, to listen to the things that they see in the Scriptures, and to obey them, it really challenges our own hypocrisy, and it challenges us to be um, disciples as well, who are obeying and applying the things that we learn. It's a, it's a, it's a real holistic model, so I love DMM so much. Um, how important is it to move in the power of the Spirit? I mean, you're in Afghanistan. This is a place where you absolutely have to be listening to the Spirit. You have to be in prayer all the time. How important is it to you to be moving in the power of the Spirit? In a place with so much death, despair, hopelessness, people is not looking for nice speeches or beautiful sermon. They are looking for experience the power of God. The Muslim here also say all the time God is kind, God is good. They repeat that many times. The experience, the touch of the Holy Spirit will make them to truly experience God's goodness and kindness and then it become more than just words, become the reason to live. Because of the goodness of God in our hearts we can face tomorrow. As the old song says, God become real. God want to touch people and when we pray the truth over someone, God himself will touch them because he wants to touch them. Yeah, this is the thing that I love, I love, is when we give God the opportunity, when we make room for, for the Lord to move, He loves to touch people. He loves to touch people, so that's awesome. So how has, I mean, getting back to DMM, how has the discipleship, the disciple-making movement, or the disciple-making model, how has DMM changed the way believers in Afghanistan are sharing the gospel? In the past... When we would share clear about Jesus from the beginning, people most of the time would get upset and put a wall toward us and would bring a lot of troubles too. The Bible says that we will be persecuted, so it will happen anyway. Myself had to move to other cities two times because of threats before. But with DMM is not about us trying to convince people that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. It is about Jesus himself touch people's hearts and teaching them. John 6 45 People need to hear to believe. RM 10 17 and we share the stories, someone need to share, RM 10 14 15, but God is the one who teaches, John 6.45, that works because is him, Jesus, working in the hearts, not us trying to convince people that they are in the wrong way, because it is all about listen from God to find the person of peace, who the hearts is open, and it is about God himself touching people then we see more results and get in less trouble, but then when we still get in trouble because it is also written that it will happen, but then that is okay, somehow we know that at the end things will work for good because it is all about him. So, for me, I would say that before was more about how can I share the gospel to this person, now is more about seeing if the person is a person of peace and then just watch to see how and when God will touch the life of this person. It is more about having the privilege to be the midwife of the children that God is touching to be born again. It is having a great impact, because it is all about God himself touching people and using these people to bring his word to more people. 
then God touches more people and just keeps going. So it works naturally and is causing a very wide impact. All right, so I have to ask this question, uh, and I hope this isn't too controversial. First of all, let me say, you know, I have great respect for John MacArthur. He, he's um, a tremendous Bible teacher. He's impacted a lot of people. Um, but he also recently claimed that Muslims are not actually coming to faith through dreams or visions. He was very adamant about this, um, and some of his uh, disciples, others in his movement, also followed up and piggybacked on that claim, uh, basically telling people, if you hear stories that Muslims are coming to faith uh, through various supernatural means, through dreams or visions, that those stories are not true. Uh, what is your personal experience, Farzaneh? John MacArthur? What I know about him is that he had wrote some books, but I never read nothing that he wrote. Me and my local friends here would not even know how is the pronunciation of his surname, and for sure my local friends never heard about him. But here we all know who is the man in white that have been appearing in dreams and vision for Muslim. In the past, when the man in white was walking here and when he died and rose again, many people said and says that it is not true and the unbelief didn't stop the man in white to keep touching lives after more than 2,000 years. That is okay that this person don't believe that Jesus is appearing to Muslim. Jesus will still appearing to Muslim and I have many stories that myself had the privilege to heard from many Muslim has and was I drug addicted for about 30 years. He is about 50 now. He lived in a faraway village and he ran to the capital because his uncle who is a religious leader wanted to send him to fight because if he died would be not a big loss because H is just a drug addicted. Less than seven months ago H was telling me about his dream. He said that he was running and a man in white, the man in white, was run behind him, and H kept running and running till there was a wall in front of him and he couldn't run anymore. Then he stopped and he turned to see if the man in white was still behind him and the man was there. H was so afraid but then the man in white, who had wound scar in his hands hugged him and he never had felt so much love as he felt when this man hugged him. I couldn't hold myself and I start to cry like a child and listen him to tell me this and I had the privilege to tell him who was this man. Nazarin was a young girl who come to live in the capital to be able to keep with her studies. She told that while in her home, she had had three dreams in the same night. The first she was sitting alone to eat and the man in white came and took the bread from the table and broken it and gave to her and told I am the bread of life. Then she woke up and slept again and dreamed that she was with the Muslim book and it started to tear by itself and went in the wind and she started to run behind the pages to try to take it and the man in white came again and told her to let it go, because that was not the truth. Then she woke up and slept again and had another dream and in the third dream she was walking with her cousin and suddenly they stop in front of two ways direction and one was a narrow way and the other large and her cousin said how we should go to the narrow way that will bring to life. Then she woke up and late went to talk to the cousin that she saw in the dream and he is a believer and he took the Bible and told her that everything she dreamed was in our book. Fatma was a nine years old when I met her in a public place where I worked before. Her family told that she was not doing well. She came from the south and because her family and her only speak P and I wanted to talk to the girl alone, I asked someone else who was around and spoke P and D to come with me and translate for me. This girl told me that she was having bad dreams every night and she couldn't sleep. After this first sentence, the person translating to me was called and she had to go. Then the girl who could only speak P start to speak with me in D. At least I heard her in D and answer to her in D, and she told me that it was not a dream. She see bad things in her room every night but she could not say that she sees because her family would think that she was crazy. But she said that two bad spirits would appear in her room when everyone around her was already sleeping and it would scare her and say that wanted to kill her. I had a long talk with her and I told her that when it would come again she could tell these two spirits to go in name of the powerful God that loved her and paid for her sin. We did a drama for her to understand well what I was saying and I was interpreting the bad things and pretending to come in her direction and she told me to go in name of the powerful God that loved her and paid for her sin. Then I pretend to fall down and get defeated by her prayer. She laughed a lot and went to her parents. Two months later I was in the hall of this same place when I saw a girl coming smiling in my direction and she asked me if I remember her. I didn't. She reminded me who she was and she told me that when she went home and their spirits came towards her again. She did all the things that I told her to do and then a man in white, the man in white, got inside of her room and with one hand in the shoulder one and the other hand in the shoulder of the other he took them out and this bad spirits never came again. 
My heart jumped in joy and listened to this girl and I told her that she could always talk to this man in white and he would talk to her and help her. I never saw this girl again because she lives in a faraway city in the south, but I know the man in white is there with her. August, I was in a conference in Germany when there was another explosion here in the capital. I got a phone call from someone I know and she told me that her brother had just left the house and she was trying to call him and she couldn't reach him. She was very afraid that he was dead, and up that nothing was left from him. He was too close to the explosion and when is like that many times nothing is left from the body. I came back and went to see her and she was deep and sad but she told me that the night before she had shared to him the story of sin and how important it was to ask forgive and get clean before God. He told that he would do that before go to bed. Next morning they had breakfast together and he encouraged her to keep studying hard and said goodbye and never came back, and nothing was left. Three days late she was in deep pain and cried till she slept. She had a dream and in this dream her brother came and kissed her and told he was okay. Behind him there was a man in white, the man in white, who had the wound scars in his hands and this man held her brother's hands and they went together and she woke up with the comfort of knowing that the man in white, the only one who can forgive and justify sin was taking care of her brother. Sorry, I think I got too excited speaking about the man in white who appear in dreams and vision for the Muslim and I forgot what was the question. I would had more stories about him to share but I think I should go back to the question. You said something about John M. And what? Me and my local friends don't know him. But we know the man in white who appears in dreams and vision to Muslim. All right. Well, I think we can uh, rest assured that the Lord is moving in the Islamic world. I love it. I love hearing these stories. Thank you so much, Farzaneh, for sharing all of this. Um, I know personally I could sit here and I could just listen to testimonies like this all the time. I always love to, when we do hear these stories, though, um, I'll say in John MacArthur's defense, I, I always love to qualify, I think it's important to qualify the fact that as much as we love the fact that Muslims are being touched, often through very powerful supernatural means, the Lord is showing up, he's, he's visiting them in dreams and visions. For every story that we hear about a Muslim that comes to faith this way, there are 10, 20 more who are coming to faith simply because a Christian out there is boldly and lovingly sharing the gospel with them. It's because a Christian is being obedient. You know, the, the vast majority of Muslims are not coming to faith just because Jesus is doing it. It's our responsibility as the body of Christ to be the inviters, to be the evangelists, to be those that are sharing the gospel. And so that, that's always important to qualify and just to say, we love these stories, we celebrate them, they're encouraging to us, and it's important to, to share them and in, encourage others. But it's also important that we remember our responsibility to do our part for us to be obedient and to love Muslims and share the gospel with Muslims. It's obvious that Jesus loves them. He's reaching out to them personally. I didn't, you know, I wasn't led to the Lord personally by Jesus, um, and yet I believe that he still loves me. But the fact that he's showing up is proof that the Lord loves the Islamic world. He loves Muslims, and he is drawing them to himself. So this is fantastic. Thank you again so much, uh, Farzaneh. I just want to thank you so much for serving and living there. And let me just end by asking this uh, final question. How can we, and how can all of those that will hear this interview, how can we pray for you? I'd heard in August from my Iranian brother about suffering well, and now me and my local family want to learn to suffer well, and you can pray for that. All the struggles, pain, losses, difficulties is real, and it is hard. I still many times allowing that to become the center of my life, and I lose the focus, and I get depressed. To suffer well is to not allow the suffering take the center and go through the pain with praises to God. We don't belong here. This place is just a moment. Our troubles is just for a moment. 2 Corinthians 4.17 And I want to lean to suffer well. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. Well, again, Farzaneh, thank you so much. Um, that is all the time that we have for this episode. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. Again, I want to remind you... Um, if you are not already a supporter of GCM, to consider becoming a regular supporter. This is a ministry that is worthy of our prayers and our support. So we'll put up a link on the screen, and this is just a great way to partner with our persecuted brothers and sisters for those that are truly laying it all down on the line um, in some of the most difficult, restricted nations throughout the Muslim world. So thank you, as always. Thank you so much. 
Um, I know many of you already do give, and, and let me just say personally, on behalf of GCM, thank you so much. So that is all the time that we have for this week. I do look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground.